Welcome to another Action for Happiness event. Delighted to welcome you all here today for this special evening with Julia Samuel uh, on the topic of change and, and adapting to the many things life throws at us. I'm really excited about this evening's event. And Julia, it's lovely to have you with us. Thank you so much for making time for this. I'm so delighted to be with you and your amazing community from all over the world. I mean, I'd love to be in a room with them, but the fact that it's so global is such an incredible joy. It feels fantastic. Thank you for really inviting is, it? me. It really is, Thank you. And yes, lovely to see everyone welcoming uh, each other from all around the world and to have thousands of us together to, to share with you this evening, Julia. So um, for anyone who's new to an Action of Happiness event, very warm welcome. For those of you who've been to many before, um, a very warm welcome back. I'm delighted to say we've had over 160,000 people join these events live during lockdown and it's always been a real inspiration to see both the community response and also all these insights that people uh, have been able to share. And um, we will be having a conversation together about this evening's theme. It's called This Too Shall Pass, that, which is also the title of your most recent book, uh, Julia. And um, as well as uh, sharing lots of the insights from that, there'll be a couple of interactive things for people to get involved with during our chat and also a chance for you watching to ask Julia questions. So please do use the Q&A function and you can even vote on other people's questions if you see another one that you'd like to have asked. As always, let's keep it friendly and kind in the chat and the conversation and try and keep it focused to what we're all here to talk about, which is really Julia's wonderful work on grief and change, as well as the more recent book, your previous book, um, Grief Works, both bestsellers. And I guess your work as a psychotherapist, Julia, and an author, has reached so many lives. Maybe we could start actually with you saying a little bit about your own journey to where, where you are now. Yes, I mean, I've been a psychotherapist for, <clears throat> sorry, my voice, over 30 years. Um, I trained as a person-centered therapist and my first kind of 25 years um, was in the NHS. So I worked at a big London teaching hospital supporting families when a child or a baby died, which I guess, is the most extreme end of loss. And through that work, <clears throat> I became found a patron and helped establish and launch the charity Child Bereavement UK, um, which is now 27 years old. And that supports families when a child dies or when a child is bereaved. But I'm not so involved with that now. I've stepped away from the NHS. And I guess what I'm taking is my learnings about grief on every level that life always brings endings, whether it's at birth or at death and through life, and that change is the only certainty that we have. Um, and my experience of any client who's come through my door, whatever their presenting issue, is that they have an uncomfortable relationship with change. Um, so that's you know, what I'd love to talk to you about tonight, about how we can navigate our way through it and what are the kind of best ways of supporting ourselves in it. Mm, thank you and I think although some of those changes are really sort of devastating life changes and we can talk about loss of loved ones and some of the many things people have been facing actually as you say change is sort of inevitable for all of us almost all the time. Why is it we find change so hard Julia? I think there are very many reasons. I think one of them is that we fear not having control and you know i think at the the beginning of the pandemic people felt terrified because they you know all their plans there was no certainty and i guess my take on that is that the things that matter to us most fundamentally we have no control so we have a lot of influence and agency over the small things in our lives but whether we are kind of get a diagnosis of cancer or that we're going to die or people that we love die or big changes happen to us, we fundamentally don't have control. So the my kind of take is that we both have to support ourselves through the change and that people who don't resist change thrive. That those that build walls against to try and block change, try and kind of impose their will over it, do less well. And change is very much part of life. And, you know, the seven-year itch is a thing. Research shows that big changes happen to us every seven or 10 years. And of course, in the last 15 months, they've happened sort of virtually every day. 
And I think that point about feeling control or, or loss of control is really important. I, I sense that many of us feel that we're failing as well when things don't go to plan or that things that we weren't hoping for or weren't expecting happen to us. Um, what's going on there? Well, I think we, we, we feel uncomfortable and we sort of think everybody else is nailing it, that they're doing it fine. But, you know, we are wired for threat. And of course, there's big degrees of threat. You know, there's extreme life threat. But change always turns on our evolutionary kind of system to look for danger. So it feels uncomfortable at one end and dangerous at another. And we sort of think we shouldn't be having those feelings. But feelings or emotions are signals of information. They're giving us information to tell us something is up. It may be that you've lost your job. It may be that you're in a global pandemic. It may be that your partner has told you they don't want to be with you anymore. And so the part of the kind of dealing with change, unwanted change or wanted change is kind of recognizing both that it feels uncomfortable, that we have to support ourselves in it, and that it is a natural process that we allow the emotions to come through us, that they have a natural cycle. And the things that we do to block them, to kind of suppress them, are often the things that do us harm over time. And one of those emotions, of course, is a sort of sense of grief or loss. And very acutely, if we have, for example, lost a loved one, but I sense that all kinds of change trigger some sense of loss, maybe, is that right? Yes, it definitely triggers loss and all the feelings that go with loss. I mean, one of the kind of least recognized feelings of loss is fear, but it's also anger, fury, numbness, um, being kind of uncertain. You feel like you've been thrown into this alien planet that you don't have a map for anymore. You can often feel very lonely. I, th I think people have felt incredibly lonely in this last year, but also I think when you're full of lots of feelings that are unfamiliar and you don't want, you both become a version of yourselves, yourself that you don't really like. People like the cheery kind of optimistic version of themselves, the sad, um, frightened version of themselves. They want to kind of push away and they think others will push away. Um, and the, and we, we don't have control of it. It has, so we have to kind of allow it to come through our system. Mm. And so, I guess the implication is that if we can be more adaptive to change and sort of respond in healthier ways, whether that's both recognizing what's really going on and also thinking about how we respond to it, that must surely help us in some way, but that can obviously be incredibly hard. You, you, you touched on earlier about one part of that is about just sort of not pushing things away. Could you say a bit more about why that's important? I mean, I think the step before that, which much, much of all of your audience will know is self-awareness, kind of mm. being aware of what is going on, you know, so that you can kind of look inside and be aware that there is a kind of a tumbling of feelings that feel unfamiliar and that you don't like or that you feel fearful. And the, the other thing is the kind of paradoxical theory of change, that the more we accept what we have no control over, the more likely it is that change will occur so that we can support ourselves through it rather than shut ourselves away from it. I just thought, was that the question you asked me? Or have I, or have yeah, I answered yeah, a different question? It was. Question? I think it's this idea that you, well, you touched on that sort of blocking out difficult feelings isn't really helpful. And I think some of our, when we talk about resilience, especially in Britain, sometimes it's sort of the stiff upper lip of like, it'll all be fine, let's soldier on. And whilst there's some... You know, that there's a sort of defense mechanism built into that it's also perhaps not leaving space to feel the difficult emotions and i think so there's many aspects of what you're saying which is one first of all <clears throat> that we learn early on from the adults around us what they have modeled about how you cope with difficulty and how you cope with feelings so all of us will have a very early kind of reflex that comes into play the moment we hear bad news and again, with this idea of self-awareness, be aware of what that is. Do you tend to shut down? Do you, you know, busyness is an anesthetic. Alcohol, drugs, you know, doing anything to avoid the feelings. But of course, they build up in us. The other part of it is that when we block them, it blocks our capacity to feel altogether. So if you 
have a kind of emotional bandwidth where you have pain this end and joy this end. When you block your capacity to feel pain, you incrementally block your capacity to feel. So you live in a much more emotional kind of limited state. And then that again is kind of self-perpetuating. The other thing about stiff upper lip is I think, as you said, we do need a bit of grit and we need stiff upper lip, but the, the importance is to have a stiff upper lip in the right place and to be open and expressive with the right people in the right place. I think people tend to kind of get locked and have a stiff upper lip everywhere, including their most intimate relationships. Or people are kind of too open in relationships or with people that aren't necessarily the best ones to support themselves, you know, maybe on, on Instagram or Facebook. So that to be kind of um, a, a, a careful, protective, about who you're talking to and how you're talking to them. Because often in families, everyone, like it, recently, everyone will have experienced what's going on differently. And we need to allow and accommodate different expressions and different ways of reacting. But we also need to hear them, that they need to be named. But I think often in families, people either don't say anything or that one of the people in the family will try and have their version that's taken on by everybody. So I think we need to give permission for multiple views and multiple ways of coping, which then we can kind of connect and allow it for each other. Mm, well does that said. make sense? It does make sense. And I wonder if now might be a time to pause and actually involve the community. We've got 2000 people here uh, live with us, Julia, right now. So that's amazing. Um, you know, you talked about being able to name what's going on and, and how change is universal for all of us. Perhaps I could invite people, if, if you feel able to, just to share some kind of change that you've been dealing with recently or at the moment, um, you know, in whatever way you'd like to share that. So just use the chat uh, and just share what's going on, because it's always, I find, quite um, yeah, grounding and inspiring to see what, what people are having to deal with. So I'm seeing, I'll read a few of these out. Diagnosis with cancer, moving house. Lack of work, lost my mum, health changed, opinionated family members, sick parent, loss of three family members, menopause, husband's death, changing career, losing, losing a, a child, child, relationship breakdown, death of son. My goodness. So, I mean, wow. The I'm, full, feeling... I'm so sorry. I feel a bit, you know, there's, I can't see your faces, all of you, but all, all of you are going through very intense, very... Um, painful times and I'm really glad you're on the call that you're looking for support for yourself I think that's a really important step and that you're connecting with each other and and supporting each other um, and I can see some of the things that you all talked about which is you know I eat or I sleep or I get busy at work um, and what I think I'm saying, and maybe wasn't clear, is that your defenses and those coping mechanisms are useful and helpful. It's not about not having them. What I'm suggesting is that you allow opportunities to both be open and express how you feel with people that you trust or journal. And then you give yourself opportunities to have a break from the pain to distract yourself, to do something that supports you, that is your normal coping mechanism, or is something that kind of feels lighter. And that the, the process of grieving, whether it's a divorce or these very um, tra you know, traumatic and difficult deaths of children and parents and partners, is to allow yourself to oscillate between the two, that you have times where you remember and emote and grieve, and times where you have a break from the grief, where you even allow yourself to laugh and you connect to others. The single biggest predictor of outcomes for any loss, whether it's a living loss or a loss by death, is the love and connection to others. And I think, you know, evenings like tonight are an important part of that, that we each need to have a kind of suite of love and support to others. And I think being in a Zoom call with thousands of others who've experienced what we're feeling stops us feeling so lonely because we can get stuck in our own kind of ruminating loop that I'm the only one feeling this. Um, and I can see that a lot of people feel lonely. I think 
one of the difficulties of grief is that it tends to feel chilly and lonely. Um, and so that's why we need love and connection to others. The other thing that helps with that chilliness, and this might be annoying, is exercise. Because our body goes into fight or flight and goes cortisol, and that blocks our capacity to connect with other people and to connect with ourselves. We kind of go on alert and it distances ourselves. So even if you go outside and just walk around the block for 10 minutes, um, or, you know, go for a run or go for a cycle. Um, I think I saw someone who said they're disabled. Maybe it's possible to do something with your arms and stretching and, and, and um, bands, that that lowers your level, stress levels and increases your oxytocin, which then means that your bandwidth to both seek support and receive support is expanded. I mean, I imagine all of you know that feeling of when you're very hyper, you can't even really talk to someone, you speak very fast and you just get more and more isolated. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd love to come on to some of those sort of tips for more restorative ways to respond to loss. And you've already talked about love and connection and physical activity. But before we do that, I just wanted to hold space and recognize what everyone's just shared on the chat there. I'm still seeing these really kind of almost excruciating sort of difficulties people are dealing with, people are sharing. So thank you everyone who's been brave enough and open enough to, to sort of vocalize that and just to echo what Julia said, which is there's a lot of things people are going through here, which are really, really hard um, and change is unbelievably hard. But you, you mentioned a particular word, Julia, which is trauma. And it feels to me from what you I've read and heard from you before that there's a particular type of almost traumatic loss that's perhaps more life-changing or challenging than perhaps what you might consider to be more day-to-day -day change. Could you say a bit more about trauma and why that's so important or difficult? So trauma, the kind of definition of trauma, it's from the Greek word to wound. And the definition is when your whole kind of mind and body system is goes into overwhelm, where whatever the event or the news or the circumstance kind of si sets your system onto very high alert. And again, it's a sort of evolutionary biology, biological response to, for Jane, to look for danger. And it sets you um, to um, kind of look for where the tiger is. But the part of it that often isn't recognized is that the memory of that experience, the traumatic memory, is stays kind of alive and can be triggered at any point in the amygdala, which is the very kind of primitive part of the brain. And that isn't processed. So it's like we get triggered by flashbacks and they are kind of turned on by sight, sound, touch or smell. So it completely blocks our cognitive thinking processes. And we are, the, the fear goes through our system by smelling the smell that happened with it, say, say it was the smell of oil, or if there was a, an ambulance, the blue light, you know, even five years later can trigger a tra the traumatic response. And the difficulty with trauma is that it blocks, so grief is an adaptive natural process that we can allow if we support ourselves in it. Trauma block is not adaptive it sort of sits there ready to be triggered. And so we have to find ways, either through journaling, through talking to a therapist, the treatment I use that um, I find most effective is something called EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And what that does is it takes the distress out of the memory by making, we have an adaptive natural system by connecting the left brain with the, with the right brain, where our wisdom of our left brain kind of tells the whole story. So we store it back into the library of our memories and takes it out of the amygdala. So then we will certainly have the memory, it will be a painful memory, but it will no longer be the smoke alarm, alarm that sends us on alert. And that is associated with lots of very difficult outcomes. It's associated with addictions, with depression, with suicide, and lots of physical ailments, a whole raft of physical ailments. So it is something that I would encourage anyone listening to 
find out for themselves whether they do, whether they have been traumatized. And I would very much encourage people to seek help for it. If I could add just one more thing is that people often talk about mental health and they talk about support, but there is a big difference between talking about it and giving yourself the permission and the motivation to get help for yourself. People tend to be much more reluctant to do that for themselves. And so my message to you is to take what we've been talking about today and from your support for each other to turn to yourself with compassion and kind of support yourself to maybe get the interventions that will, will improve your outcomes. Mm. Thank you. That's very wise. And I, I maybe we, later on we could talk about some of those interventions and maybe even include some links uh, in our follow up yeah. messages to everyone who's been here tomorrow. Um, but on the subject of loss and trauma, of course, we are still in the midst of an amazing global pandemic that's caused such devastation and lost so many lives, um, both, you know, locally and globally. And I sense that's been a, a very traumatic experience for many of us, although in different ways, in different places at different times. And I suspect that quite a lot of that grief hasn't really been processed yet. What are your observations on this rather crazy sort of last 12 to 15 months? I mean, as someone who specializes in grief, I have never seen the level of suffering that I've seen in the last year. I mean, you know, I can feel it in my body as I kind of remember all the stories and of her, I've heard and the clients I have supported. I think one of the, you know, I think I'm going to be telling everybody things that they already know. So I'm just confirming what you already kind of believe. But the two most difficult, or three most difficult aspects is the sudden and traumatic nature of the deaths. That even a quite elderly person could have been very well, could have got on the bus and gone shopping on a Tuesday, had a temperature on a Wednesday, gone in an ambulance to a hospital on Thursday and be dead by the weekend. So it's, there's no preparation, it's sudden and out of the blue. And that is very much linked to trauma. The other devastating aspect of it is that people had no opportunity to be present. I mean, I think they did in the second and third lockdown, but certainly for the first lockdown, but it was only one family member. I worked with hundreds of people through organizations who watched their lifelong partners or their parents die through an iPad on a screen while they were at home. They, they couldn't speak to them. They didn't say goodbye to them properly. They didn't hold their hand. And that sets up a whole raft of what ifs and regrets. You know, if only I had, I wanted to say, and that, and that feeds in and derails the natural grieving process. And then the third aspect is of course, the kind of either Zoom funerals or very kind of minimal um, eight, you know, num only eight people allowed funerals. And, and the difficulty of that is that you know, grief is invisible. And once the person has died and they've been buried, the, it, the experience of it is invisible. So you kind of carry it in you. And what helps us at such traumatic and difficult times are rituals. You know, these rituals of a funeral have been in this country and the world for like six or 7,000 years. And they are a natural human response to deal with intense intensely difficult, painful times, that we mark the death, we come together, we say familiar prayers, we do familiar rituals, which both, both honours the person who has died, helps us face the reality of the death, which is the first most painful task of mourning, is letting ourselves know in a way that we can't not know that the person has died. And thirdly, connects us to our community and the friends and the family that love the person and love us. And that last piece is this terrible isolation that many people have um, experienced, grieving alone or grieving with one other person and not having that normal community of people dropping in, of, of sitting shiver or coming for the funeral into the wake afterwards. And so what I hear from people, and I'd love to know, love is the wrong word. I'd be very interested to know what people listening are saying is that, 
um, they feel like their grief has been suspended, that they kind of know something terrible has happened. They feel devastated, but they feel like they're in limbo, that they've, they're still at the day of the death, as if nothing has, nothing has changed. And that with the unlock coming, they sort of see other people, what they perceive, because obviously we never quite know what other people are doing, but their perception is other people are going back to their new normal, they're going back to their lives, they're gonna have fun and go to concerts and pubs, and their life has been turned upside down. And they're only at the very raw beginning of this journey, and they don't quite know how they're gonna cope with being with people or seeing people or do, doing things they haven't done before. So it will take them back to day one. You know, that first time you meet someone for coffee, when they look in your eyes and you see each other's sadness, you both cry. That will be happening hundreds of times for people in a way that feels, I think, very overwhelming. Mm. That, that concept of grief being suspended, I think is so powerful and sadly suggests there's still quite a lot more that we have to collectively deal with as a result even as we unlock and hopefully begin to move on. But let's let's now move can, on. Can I add what can I add yeah, one please. thing? Which is I think the thing, you know, so eight significant every death will affect between eight and nine people significantly. The level of the loss is equal to the level of the love and the emotional investment in the person who has died. And as a community, the thing that Action for Happiness is brilliant at is altruism. And I think we all are experiencing a collective grief. And I think one of the ways that we can make ourselves feel better um, and the community who are bereaved better is to reach out and be in contact with someone that you know that is bereaved mm. and ask them what they want. And the big thing would be to listen. But in doing that, they don't then have to ask for help, but, you know, kind of move towards them with kindness and um, uh, empathy. And then that will help you to feel like you're doing something and you'll feel better and they will feel better too. That's so, that's so wise. And I think that idea of listening, again, just becomes so important and you know, I've had to learn the hard way that what people don't want is solutions and to be fixed or to be told it's all fine. They just want to be heard and accepted and held and listened to and just create space for them to express how they're feeling. And I've certainly learned the hard way that, you know, that there are helpful and unhelpful ways of supporting people in difficult times. So, yes, listening. And I guess that comes back to this point about love and connection ultimately being the things that perhaps matter most. I think, I mean, I like you being so honest. I imagine you've been the kind of, um, can't not the sort of, I can't think of the word, cartoon male that's trying to fix things and your partner exactly. or your children are saying, shut yeah. up, dad. <laughs> I don't want you to say you can just catch the train from this and you can do that. You want them, they want you to hear them. That's exactly right. I just, you know, that, that instinct to sort of say, oh, what you want to do is, but that isn't helpful. So yes, you, you've understood my, my challenges very well. <laughs> Um, I got hooked on that. I can't remember what you said after that. Well, it was, I mean, I was just, um, maybe we'll come back to this point because I think that one of the key things you talked about is love and connection. Maybe we can oh, yeah. back and get to questions, but just taking a sort of so slight sidestep, you, you did talk about some of the restorative things we can do. We can't change what has happened to us, but we can change our response to it, both in terms of how we accept the change, but also what we might then choose to do, even little mini actions. So, you mentioned early on physical activity. Uh, what, what are some of the other restorative things that you and indeed others have found helpful with dealing with change? I think one of the things is to <clears throat> actively support yourself. So often people, you know, I've said this before, but people that have a kind of shitty committee where they turn against themselves when they're grieving that somehow they're doing it wrong or they're failing and they've got to stop making a fuss and they've got to get on. So to be as kind to themselves as they would to a friend or a neighbor. Um, I think one of the, the big things to recognize is that we can do this oscillation between loss orientation and um, uh, restoration orientation. So when you've given yourself half an hour to remember the person has died. So one of the things that I think is often kind of instinctively known, but isn't kind of recognized is that the task of mourning is to face the reality of the loss, 
to really know that this person, that pr their, uh, the presence of that absence is irreversible, is permanent. But the love for them never dies. And the love always continues. And that by having touchstones to memory, by intentionally choosing things to do that you remember the person, it may be wearing their watch, it may be cooking their favorite recipe, it may be making a playlist that reminds you of them, it may be going for a walk with a friend or a family member that you always walked with that person. It may be putting flowers in a particular place in your house every week that is the kind of flowers for them so that that links you to them. And, you know, I think most people listening will know that when someone dies, you talk to them, you talk to them in your head. Some people go to the graveside to talk to them, but a lot of them just say, dad, shall I marry that guy? Or shall I take that job? They want the answer. <laughs> um, and so that the conversation and the connection continues. And you know, my parents' generation was very much forget and move on. Don't think about it, push forward. And what we now know, now know is to remember and stay connected, that this thing of continuing bonds, the relationship continues. Mm, so the person may not be there, but the love hasn't died. It's still there. Yeah. And, and gets played out in, in hundreds of small and big ways through the day and through your lifetime, that you can have, ha have had a partner that's died. You may really have processed your grief and a living a life. You may have married again or be in a committed relationship or whatever kind of relationship. And then you smell bacon, which is their favorite thing that they cooked on a Saturday morning and you could be hit with the grief. So rather than saying to yourself, oh no, I haven't done the work. I haven't been grieving. I've been thrown back. It's to kind of recognize, oh, there you go, there he is. You know, that's what that is. And allow yourself, allow the feelings to come through in the memory. Mm. I think, I mean, the, there are many things um, about grief that I think are important for people to remember. Exercise is a really big one. Um, know your limits that you are, you've like had like five layers of skin taken off you. You don't have the same robustness and resilience that you did before the grief. So treat yourself with that tenderness that you need. Don't push yourself to do things that feel too much and have a good no. You know, there's that expression, what's your yes worth if you never say no? Like put in boundaries. You know, if you, ha if you really don't want to do something, be clear in your no. And the other big thing is to recognize that you know, we, we, people want grief to be over with. They want to feel better and they naturally will accommodate the loss. That's what we talk about. It isn't that you, forget, that you get over it, but you accommodate it. You build your life around the loss um, and your life expands. You can even have post-traumatic growth, but it takes longer than we want. Grief is a long old haul, particularly if it's been a traumatic and sudden death. Now, Grief has its own timetable, I saw someone read. Yeah. Oh, yes, there's lots of fantastic things in the chat. And we will also share the chat um, in our follow up tomorrow if you'd like to read back through all this conversation. And I'd all love that. Yeah. Season, which is Feels lovely. very moving. Um, uh, many people in the community are familiar with the 10 keys to happier living model. That yes. I, have. And I gather you sometimes use that with people that you're working with as well. Oh, look at that. Fantastic. It's with you right now. Um, but these, this idea of sort of small micro acts, which at one level might seem a little bit irrelevant when dealing with really big change. Why do some of those little positive actions still matter so much? I think because when we've had sort of seismic massive change, whether it's a living loss or a loss by death, small micro acts can give us a sense of agency and they, we, we maintain good habits through the feel good emotion that they give us. So if you do one of your things, which is, you know, connect with people, and you set yourself a task, I'm going to connect with two people a week. And it may be just for 10 minutes that, you know, to set your, what people talk about is the power of habit and small, tiny habits have amazingly large outcomes. So set yourself small habits that are good for you, that you then go, yay me, I spoke to, on FaceTime to a friend or I 
planted the, I wanted to do something for my garden. Gardening is very therapeutic. I planted the seeds in my garden, go me. And that takes 10 minutes. So not to set yourself unrealistic things. Mm. Well, You're smiling note, away. Have you read turn, something? We could just turn back to the community again. People share very openly some of the changes they've been dealing with. I would love to sort of take one step forward from that and ask people to share things that they find really helpful along the lines of what you've just been sharing, Julia. What are the little actions or indeed the big actions that you take here in this community to help that really help you when dealing with difficult changes? So again, I'll as these come in, I'll just read a few of them out. So gardening, yoga, going for a walk, art, gratitude list, crafting, meditation, being outdoors, helping students, mindful walking and eating, music, running, painting, dancing, sleeping. These webinars help, thank you for saying that. <laughs> Building nice. airfix, playing with dogs, spending time with pets, kickboxing, EFT. I do that. Wonderful. Um, bubble baths, yeah, barefoot walking, dancing around the house. Lots of, yeah, I feel sort of up uplifted by seeing that list. How's that affecting yes. you? I mean, it's lovely to see that people are doing things that actively support them. And the, the kind of piece that they already know is the mind-body connection, that every thought that you have has a physiological component and everything you do physically will give you a thought. So if you're doing things like gardening or yoga or meditation or cold water swimming, that releases the, the kind of distress and the hurt in your body, you feel it suffusing your whole body. And that is the way to build your resilience, to kind of have more musculature, I can't say that word, to um, be able to withstand when you get another kind of surge of, of feelings of loss or despair. And people often talk about grief, that it comes in waves. And again, this is living losses as well as from death. But if you intentionally do things like your, the community you've been talking about, that calms your whole system down so that you move up and down the gears. And when you move down and you know that you have agency to do that for yourself, that it has a kind of triple effect because you feel like you've done it for yourself. It does make you feel better. You're more able to connect with others and actually it, physiologically and incrementally you're also able to adapt to the reality of the loss more mm. because eventually over time you learn to live with this new reality and it is by doing this combination of supporting yourself and allowing yourself to name what's going on and what's difficult so i want to move on to questions we've had some great questions from the audience but just to sort of wrap up this this sort of conversation which i've really enjoyed so many insights you, you've mentioned a few times the importance of love and connection, and it strikes me that this is both true in terms of when we're dealing with challenging loss, grief, change, being able to reach out and make those connections is important, but also if we want to help those around us who might be dealing with change as well. And I know there's so much, as you say, kindness and altruism in this community, then, that, then providing that sense of connection for others and allowing them the space to share how they're doing and coping or not is really important. Uh, uh, how, how can we really sort of make that part of our daily practice, do you think? I mean, I think, you know, recognizing that when someone looks back at their life, it is the quality of their relationships that defines the quality of their life. And honestly, if we are going to have good relationships, we need to prioritize them. We need to give them time. I mean, I, I remember Laurie Santos talking about on one of your webinars. I've been a big fan of Action for Happiness for many, many years, and I listened to hers. And she talked about time affluence. You know, when people weren't commuting, they did have more time at home. And what I kind of wanted people to recognize is not to use that time to send more emails and stay hooked at work, but to use that time to invest and just be with and sit around the table, even not say very much, but be with each other so that you have this sense of connection together with, with each other in your families or with your close relationships. Mm, thank be you, in the Julia. moment, as Tracy said, yeah. Yeah, let's come on to some of these great questions. So Kate has asked, um, asked you to say a bit more about this phrase you said a few times, living loss or living grief. 
Um, you know, is it that we can live with a profound sense of loss, even if we haven't had a physical death to deal with? Can you say yes, a bit more about that? So that you're absolutely right, is that a living loss, I think, has the same emotions of grief from death, but is often underrecognized how um, or the difficult the emotions are. So we kind of acknowledge grief from death, but we don't acknowledge grief from divorce or grief from losing your job or grief from not being able to get pregnant or grief from um, having to move country or be away from home or not be allowed to come home because of visas or, or a pandemic. And the experience of that loss has all the emotions of grief by death. So it, you can feel sad, you can feel despair, you can feel furious, you can feel fearful, you can feel them all at once, you can feel numb, you can feel powerless. And I think legitimizing it and giving yourself permission to grieve this loss, whatever this is, is and the self-awareness of what's going on is the first step of learning to accommodate and process it as you would a grief from death. Thank you. And on a sort of related point or building on that, Linda's asked a question coming back to the pandemic. She says, I feel the pandemic has brought a huge amount of grief, not only through the lives lost, which has obviously been really traumatic, but also the loss of a way of life. How could we like reposition or think about this type of loss, you know, the loss of many of the sort of things we used to do, I guess, that we can't do anymore? I mean, I think Linda has named it, you know, that there is a collective grief from a way of life of you know, plans that we had and, and all the, the living losses of, of weddings and birthdays and rituals. I mean, they sound small, but they're very significant in people's lives. Um, so I think the, it's the same process really is to recognize and, you know, when people talk about collective grief, often they talk about this sense of overwhelm that they feel like they can't kind of cope. And what I suggest is that, you can go in to a room and see a whole mass of really difficult things. But don't look at all of them, just take one thing from the room and examine it and name it. So in your collective grief or the loss from our way of life, talk about whatever it is that feels most significant to you in this moment and talk about it with a friend. Go, I mean, I think walking and talking is one of the most therapeutic things that you can do because you're not eyeballing each other you have the kind of movement together of the rhythm of being side by side. You're in nature, which is in itself healing. And you can have silences. But, you know, you could go with a friend and take it in turns about what parts of their ways of life that you each miss and just really listen to each other. And then in doing that, that can free you to look at things that might be opportunities, that might be what you have chances to do now that you didn't before or that you'll give yourself permission to do now that you thought, thought you never would. So, you know, I think holding both loss and restoration is side by side is always important. What is a memory book? I just saw that. A memory mm. book is where you, and you can do it in many different ways. You might buy a book from a, a news agent and put in, photographs or tickets or memorabilia or um, other people's cards that is a touchstone to the memory of the thing that you've lost. So it could be a person that's died, but it may be an aspect of your life. And so that you, you can do it as a family. It's a really nice thing to do as a family collectively, and you can build on it. So you can do one or two pages, and then over time, you can do many more pages or you can do another book. And it's a, again, because grief is invisible and our feelings are, you know, like if, if you're an iceberg, two thirds of what's going on is below the waterline, you don't see it. The third is our faces and what we're saying. So a memory book is a lovely way of kind of accessing what's hidden below the waterline and giving it image form that you can go back to and it doesn't change. I mean, you can change it, but you have this sense of control, um, which I think is really helpful. Well, that sense of control is very much the subject of this next question from Paul, who very self-awarely says, one of my key traits is that I yearn for security. And as a result, change is not one of my strong points. What advice would you give me? Well, I mean, Paul, I, I, 
we are, we all want security. We both we need safety. We need that sense of safety. So I think, as as Mark said, recognizing that you don't like change and you have a feel you fear that lack of safety, I think, is a really important first step. I think one of the things that <laughs> help us most, and I don't know if this is possible for you, Paul is contact with other people, like a 20 second hug really does the business. So it doesn't ask very much of you, but again, it's that animal instinct of like being held by somebody slows you down, you feel the presence of them and it kind of gives you a breath. So when you're feeling very fearful, think about the things that you can intentionally do that give you a sense of safety. Is it a hug? Is it, breathing, obviously meditation really helps. Music, having a, a safe music playlist. So I put on, when I feel kind of scared, I, I put on, this is a little bit too much information, but I put on 80s music because it takes me back to a time when I was very carefree. I didn't have a lot of worries and it just reminds me of dancing a lot. And I get that signal through my body. And once I've let that even just play for five minutes, I feel in a different mood. And so then I can do other things that help my sense of safety. I hope, Paul, that answers your question. I think anything that involves dancing to 80s music has got to be a good <laughs> can, I um, add, can I add yeah. something about the sense of safety and how well, maybe someone else has said this on one of your webinars, is that, you know, there's this big debate about genetics, about nature and nurture, and the two very much influence each other. But the other thing to recognize that some of us are born genetically more sensitive to others. So what people talk about is having an orchid, which is very um, sensitive or being born a dandelion. So it would help for you to recognize if you were born someone who you can get overwhelmed very fast, whereas your brother may be a dandelion who just was kind of coped with everything. But if you recognize that you are an orchid, that you need to develop many coping mechanisms that give you time out to slow down, to settle yourself, to calm yourself down, and then you can move back in. There's a, there's a very good book by uh, Elaine Aron called Highly Sensitive People. Um, and she describes that. So if you're born with thin skin, support yourself more. Mm. Well, in terms of supporting ourselves, this question is really, you know, a, a, a difficult situation to be in, uh, just from the initials MP, who says, as a mother, I'm grieving the loss of my son who took his life. And I'm, I'm just so sorry to hear that. Um, she says, it's been hard, too many whys, as I did not know um, he was depressed. How can I deal with this profound grief? I'm just sending a lot of love and thoughts to you in, in reading that. Um, I am so sorry. I mean, that is a, a truly devastating loss. And, you know, I, I never talk about there being a hierarchy of grief. I don't think there is one that's necessarily worse than another, but there are some that are certainly much more complex than others. And suicide um, is incredibly complex. Suicide of your son, you know, which is a death out of time. And it's your son, it's the reverse of nature, it tears up the rule book of life, is completely devastating. I think, I mean, there's nothing I can say, obviously, that can help you fix it. Because as you say, you have this kind of looping of questions of why. One of the um, aspects of suicide that I find over the decade, decades, and I've worked with many people who've been bereaved by suicide, is that we think about a suicide as a heart attack of the brain, so that you know a young person can just go for a walk and suddenly have a heart attack, that the neural networks in their heart, the electricity doesn't work anymore. And I think for suicide, a third of all suicides are, are sudden and unexpected, it kind of come out of the blue, and that sounds like that's your son like the firing in his neural networks in his brain just completely misfired. And that led um, to the suicide. Whether that's a concept that you can think about and that, that you might find useful, 
I don't know. The, the thing that I would encourage MP is that this is too hard a grief to manage on your own. And there are support groups, there's SOBs, survivors of bereavement by suicide, there's Papyrus, they're a really good group. Um, there's the Su Suicide Alliance. Um, and through them, you should access support. Please, someone's put the link in. Thanks, Jenny. Um, please get support for yourself. Don't kind of kind of get locked in on your own, asking or ruminating over the questions. The other thing is, of course, because it's such a complex death, it takes a really long time to kind of rebuild yourself back into life. Can I add one more thing, Mark? I'm talking so much. That's why you're here, Julia. Please do. We want to hear from you. When, if you're looking at yourselves and you're bereaved from death, um, like MP, but also from a living loss, there are things that help you understand the significance of it. So it would be your history of loss. So someone who's had previous losses, multiple losses, will be very vulnerable. It will be your psychological makeup. It could be that you're an orchid or, or a dandelion, but it could be many other things. It, and it would be also your attachment profile, like how secure was your attachment? Did you have good, reliable, loving, connected parents? Or did you have quite an insecure childhood where you already kind of have adverse childhood experiences that that would affect your capacity to grieve? It's affected by your, the circumstances of the death. So how did the death happen? When did it happen? When did it happen in your life? What was going on at the time of the death? It will be affected by your relationship to the person that died. And that can be extreme. It can be as devastating when someone that you've had a terrible relationship like your dad or your mom or a sibling dies because you can no longer go back and resolve the difficulties. Or it could be the most significant person in your life. Um, or it could be like a, a death out of time, um, like your child dying. And so when you're kind of looking at yourself, those are the layers of complexity. And the more difficulty there is in each aspect, the more you, forgiveness for yourself, yes, Kathy, the, the more you need to kind of recognize that you need to access support for this, that you, you do need to get help. Mm. Well, thank you for the question and thank you for that really thoughtful answer. Um, one of the things you've talked about in our time together has been being willing to share what's really going on and sort of almost make, opening ourselves up and perhaps being a bit more vulnerable in the right circumstances. But again, that raises questions as well. And, and Wynne has asked, Julia, do you mean that we should show our vulnerability to others as opposed to suppressing it? Um, this is something that other people around us might find uncomfortable and difficult. And that's certainly something, I, a balance I found hard to strike, sort of sharing what's really going on whilst not wanting to make others feel awkward or doing that in an inappropriate context. So vulnerability is this thing that Brené Brown, who is completely brilliant, has made kind of fashionable. And she talks about, you know, um, that with shame, we hide the aspects of ourselves. And when we kind of show our most personal, authentic selves, then we have love and connection and then we we thrive and we do better. My Brené is amazing, I agree. The, the, the piece that I want to put into that is again, what I said a bit earlier is choose who you're vulnerable with. Choose someone who you really trust, who really will listen to you. You know, like step by step, like don't kind of test yourself going to be vulnerable with, you know, on a public um, platform. But like go for a walk with someone who you really like and begin to find the words of what is going on inside you of something that you haven't quite dared look at for yourself. But as you're walking and talking to this person that you that you know really cares about that will really give you the attention and time and warmth that you need, you kind of slowly unpick and have a way of discovering these aspects of yourself that you've kind of hidden in your cellarage. And that is one version of vulnerability that you kind of expose to the air, you turn a light on in the kind of darkness in the room of, the, of your room. And in turning the light on, you the something happens, something shifts and you do begin to heal. But please do it, um, you know, wisely. 
Paulette has made a point here about trust. And I think many of us who want to create a happier and more sort of emotionally intelligent, compassionate world see trust as a really big part of that, you know, trust in each other and you know, social trust more broadly. But Paulette's point is that the loss or ending of a relationship can often lead to trust issues in the future. So being able to trust future partners or trust that a new relationship will, will work out or even arise. Do you have any advice on, on sort of, I guess it's about staying hopeful or, or carrying on feeling that you can trust in others when perhaps you've had a loss or a, a letdown? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be a therapist if I didn't think that people could change. So I think you have your default distrust if you've had an insecure, untrusting um, early life. But again, it's these small steps of, of talking honestly and trust building kind of small trusting relationships that over time you really build. And the thing that underpins trust is a lot of it is your relationship with yourself that you believe love is the strongest medicine love is the thing that heals the wounds from the past and a big aspect of that I would suggest is that you let yourself know that you are worthy of being loved that you trust yourself first and then in doing that you can open yourself to trusting this relationship with someone else what often happens is that you choose people who are untrustworthy because fundamentally you're repeating the same pattern that happened to you, either because you think this time I'm going to make it different or because you don't fundamentally believe that you're worthy of the love that you so badly need. Mm. Julia, this has been um, an amazing conversation. I, I feel like I've learned a lot and I've been really affected by things people have shared and I'm very yeah. grateful to everyone who's been here this evening and shared both the, the difficulties we're going through and also the kind of ways in which people are coping and finding humour and spontaneity and joy and connection as well as all the, the difficulty. And I would like to say a huge thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening and thank those you. who very generously made a donation to, to Action for Happiness to allow us to keep putting on these events and to keep sharing all these this wisdom. Uh, um, we're so grateful to you, Julia, particularly though, because it's now, your work is so important and it feels so timely right now and I think all of us have taken away a lot um, this evening. I wondered in, in our last sort of minute or so together is there any sort of final thoughts you've already talked about how at the end of the day it perhaps all comes back to, to love and connection but what, what, what's what would you like to leave us with as we, as we sort of leave this topic today? Can I leave you with a tool and a thought? Please. <laughs> so I've, I've designed an app called the Grief Works app which I know Mark is going to send out to you tomorrow. And it's like having me in an app on your phone where it's a 28 day course where if you're looking for support, I've seen lots of people say they've been desperate for support, they can't find it. So that is a place that they can find it. But also on Instagram, I do lots of little small videos um, that talk about trauma and grief and what supports you. So do come and find me on Instagram. I think my last, you know, you said my my quote. I, I I think the difficulty is that pain is the agent of change. Pain is the thing that forces us to face this new reality that we're living in a pandemic, that we may have lost our job, or that the person we love most in the world has died. And the task is to allow ourselves to both feel the pain and reach out and get the love and support of others. When something dies, when the, we lose something that we love, the thing that helps us heal most is the love of others. So whether you're a friend or whether you're bereaved, we need each other and we need to prioritizing it by giving it our time. And I would encourage, I think coming here is a version of that. I think what you do, Mark, and the community that joins you is a very powerful way of having love and connection. Because also it's not asking very much. You know, when you're really hurting, you only have so much energy, you have limits. And this I think is a lovely way of people feeling connected without feeling overwhelmed or exhausted. <laughs> That's really kind of you to say. And thank you so much again, Julia. Keep up the inspiring work. And as we said, we'll be sharing a link to 
this video and the chat and the resources you've mentioned uh, in the follow up to everyone who signed up. So thank you everyone for being here and Julia, thanks once again. Thank you to the audience. I've been incredibly moved by your comments and joining us and um, I hope we can continue the conversation.